let me straighten one thing out right at the beginning. The Australian newspaper, the Verbal D and Marion Lay, and quoted us as saying that the Malaysian, that the Nauru solution, that the Nauru solution is better. Well, closer to the mark. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? Okay. If you can't hear me, put your hand up. I wasn't talking. Okay, how's that? That's as good as it gets. Okay. Um, Marion Lay and I were both verbal by the Australian newspaper who quoted us as saying that the, that the Nauru solution is better than the Malaysian solution. And in one sense they were accurate because the Malaysian solution is worse, but only in the sense that garroting is worse than hanging. And I'll tell you what's wrong with both solutions. And no one in Parliament, apart from Adam, seems to have grasped this. Both the solution that uses Malaysia and the solution that uses Nauru involves sending people to another country where they will be processed, and if they're found to be refugees, as most of them will, they will then wait up to a decade before some country other than Australia agrees to take them. All we're doing is throwing them into a bottomless pit where they will just have to wait and wait and wait. Whereas what we should be doing is processing them on shore while they live in the community so that if they are found to be refugees, as most of them will be, they can be resettled and, and live in Australia and start contributing to the Australian community. One of the great advantages of doing what Adam suggested is that it will reduce or avoid the completely unnecessary psychiatric harm which we are inflicting every day on people held in mandatory detention. Because let's face it, if you lock up innocent, traumatised people for long enough and you can't tell them when they'll be released, they will eventually break. And when they break, they'll either lash out of their environment or they'll start harming themselves. And we've seen it happening recently and it's so predictable. It will cost us millions of dollars in trying to fix the harm that we've caused. And for some reason, the politicians don't seem to care about how much of your tax they spend mistreating innocent human beings. You've got to let them know it's not good enough and we're not going to put up with it any longer. Uh, Adam told you the story, the, the, the question rather, that he would like to ask the Prime Minister. Well, I've got a question I'd like to ask her as well. Let me give you a moment's background. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who has just fled the Taliban. They've cashed in everything they can. They've begged and borrowed in order to get enough money to pay a people smuggler to get them away from the threat of the Taliban. And eventually they end up in Indonesia. In the meantime, they've passed through a series of countries, including Malaysia, which haven't signed the Refugees Convention and offer them no protection. There they are in Indonesia. They can go to the UNHCR and they will very likely be accepted as genuine refugees and then they will wait for 10, 12, 15 years. They will wait in Indonesia, living in the shadows, because if they're found, they'll be jailed, not allowed to work, not allowed to send their kids to school. They face the indefinite uncertainty of wondering where their lives will be spent and when their lives will be allowed to restart. They've got an option. They can sit there, sweating it out in Indonesia, watching their kids' lives blighted, watching their own futures blighted, or they can make a dash for it, a dangerous ride on a dangerous boat to get to freedom and safety in Australia. Well, my question for Julia Gillard is, if she were in that position, what would she do? What would you do? Wouldn't you make a run for it? Wouldn't, want you, wouldn't you want to get your kids to safety? Wouldn't you want to do what it takes to get yourself to safety and make sure you have a life? So why do we have to mistreat the people who do nothing more than what we would do if we were unlucky enough to be in their shoes? Every time you meet someone who isn't among the converted, who doesn't agree with what we think, who sides with one or other of the major parties, Every time you meet someone like that, ask them, what would you do? What would you do? And they will all give you the same answer. They would do what the asylum seekers do. Why should you punish them for doing that? 
Now let me tell you, it's very easy to get a bit pissed off at Julia Gillard, because frankly her performance has been pretty disappointing on this issue. Kevin Rudd and Chris Evans were doing a terrific job. The change, if you remember, happened within minutes of Tony Abbott getting control of the coalition. He started beating the boat people drum and Kevin Rudd pretty quickly fell into step. Now, I want to tell you something about Tony Abbott. You probably know that Tony Abbott uh, spent years at a Roman Catholic seminary. He is one of the most uh, well-educated Christians in this community. And yet what he is doing is the greatest hypocrisy if he is a genuine Christian. Here is a man who claims to be an adherent of Christian teaching and yet he is willing to propound the idea of punishing innocent human beings in order to dissuade other people from asking for our help. He deserves to be condemned not only for his cruelty but also for his hypocrisy. If ever you get the chance to meet Tony Abbott face to face, and I've got to say, he seems like an interesting character, apart from his awesome hypocrisy. If you ever get a chance to meet Tony Abbott, ask him what he would do if he was in the position of both people who've arrived in Indonesia. Maybe if you got an honest answer from him, and that's a big if, but if you got an honest answer from him, he might say that he'd make a dash for it as well. Because Tony Abbott, like all of us, has the human impulse for survival. And that's what refugees are all about. Remember this too. In the first four months of this year, the rate of arrival of boat people was less than half the rate of arrival of boat people in the same period last year. So what's all this tough talk all about? Why do we have to get brutal when the numbers are already falling? And here's one more question before I stop. It's very easy for the politicians to talk about which is tougher. How do we send the toughest message? How do we break the people smugglers business model? That's the latest rhetoric. Can I actually interrupt myself and tell you something about people smugglers? Yeah, they're not all necessarily vile, dreadful people. They may not be, they may not, not be the greatest specimens of humanity. But let's not forget that Oscar Schindler was a people smuggler. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a people smuggler. The nuns in The Sound of Music were people smugglers. They're not all bad. We know a Hazara guy who used people smugglers, a Pashtun people smuggler, to get him away from Afghanistan. He had a set tariff. This much gets you to Australia. A bit more gets you to Europe, and a bit more still gets you to America. But for Hazaras, the sworn enemy of the Pashtun, he offered half price. He can't have been a bad guy, you know? So let's, let's get a bit sensible about attacking people smugglers. It's just Tony Abbott's disguised way of attacking boat people. Because without people smugglers, the boat people can't get here, and that's his objective. Now, back to what I was saying. People smugglers, sorry, boat people are innocent of any offence, and many of the signs around here today show that you know that. What's the morality of mistreating innocent human beings in order to influence the conduct of others? How ethical is it to mistreat innocent people in order to achieve a different purpose? It's obviously plainly unethical by any standard, anywhere. Tony Abbott really should know better. So if you're feeling a bit cheesed off about Julia Gillard, hold your fire and attack Tony Abbott, because that man is the problem. And his hypocrisy is breathtaking. Stop, stop locking up innocent people. End mandatory detention and never give up, even if we have to go on for the next decade. Thank you, Julian.